Yeah. Yeah. Now let's try that again. What? Where is that? I go from the beginning. I want to go to full screen and get rid of my notes at the bottom. All right. Okay. Having a just a little bit of. No. I I don't see the. Uh, what? Nothing. All right. Let me let me try this again. Full screen. <laughs> Oh, okay. You have icons in the top row that you could use for presentation mode also. From beginning. Yeah. All right. Let me try that. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thank, thank you for uh, being here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about Glenn Hammond Curtis. He was a uh, pioneer in the aviation uh, field. Um, I gave this presentation first to our peer group at Hofstra University um, because we had just joined the group and I knew I had to do something. And I went to a um, ceremony at the Cradle of Aviation Museum uh, here on Long Island. And they were inducting three people into their Aviation Hall of Fame, Glenn Curtis was one of them. They handed out a little piece of paper with some information about him. Uh, I knew who he was, but I really didn't know too much about him. So I thought I would research that and then I gave that presentation. Uh, so that was 11 years ago and uh, I've updated it. Since then, uh, I think I got another book or two so uh, Glenn Curtis, uh, we're going to talk about uh, his life, uh, a little bit about his early life before he got into aviation. Uh, go over the aviation milestones that he's responsible for uh, and talk some about his feud with the Wright brothers. And then we'll wind up, wind up uh, talking about his uh, legacy. So he was born in 1878 in Hammondsport, New York, which is in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, it's right on uh, the shore of Lake Kuka. Um, he left school after the eighth grade. Um, his father had died when he was an infant. Uh, and he felt obligated to uh, help the family finances. So he had been away from uh, Hammondsport and he came back and there was a young lady in town that uh, he fell in love with and, and married, uh, I think just before his 20th birthday. Um, he had been working in a, a pharmacy. Uh, the pharmacy was doing very well and he didn't feel that he had to maintain his position there. So because he had become uh, a bicycle racer uh, working for the Eastman company, um, his job was to make deliveries. And he decided that he could do that much more quickly if he had a bicycle. So he saved up his money, bought a bicycle, and was doing very well. Um, so he opened up a bicycle shop. Um, he started designing bicycles, uh, building them, and he continued racing. But bicycles could only go but so fast. So he sent away for a engine to uh, put on a bicycle and make a motorcycle, but the engine was not very good. So he started building engines himself, but he continued as a bicycle racer. Uh, and it was really his engine designs and manufacture that wound up getting him into uh, the aviation industry. He became a, an early pilot, uh, a demonstrator of airplanes, and truly an aviation pioneer. Uh, 
and he died in 1930 at the age of 52. So in aviation, just a quick summary, uh, he was an early designer. He was an innovator. He had always been a problem solver in terms of mechanical things. Uh, when he was a kid, he was fixing uh, appliances and such for his neighbors. Um, so he always would look at, at something and say, all right, there's a problem here. How do we solve it and figure out a way to do that? He became an airplane manufacturer and that led to him becoming a successful businessman. Um, by the time he left the aviation industry, he was, he was a rich man, but he only spent 13 years there. And much of that time, uh, his progress was hampered by the Wright brothers' lawsuits. And we'll talk more about that. And that all had to do with patent infringement. So he goes on, uh, in 1901, he builds a motorcycle engine. And oops, if you can see this one, this is a V8. Um, so he had to construct a bicycle that he could put it on. And you can see very long handlebars. Um, the first time he got on this thing, it wasn't clear that it would stay erect, uh, but it did. Uh, so this was his first motorcycle after the, uh, the engine was ready. And in 1903, he sets a world speed record, 64 miles an hour. And either three or four years later, depending on what source you look at, um, he got up to 136 miles an hour. And that lasted a few years until it was finally beaten by uh, someone in a race car. Uh, towards the end of the year, he had an accident with the motorcycle. And that's when he moved into aviation anyway. So he stopped with motorcycles. Between 1902 and 1904, he had the G.H. Curtis Manufacturing Company. He called his motorcycles the Hercules, although a company on the West Coast uh, found out about that and said, we use that name first. So he had to take Hercules off the motorcycles and put his own name on it. He was also designing and building light, high horsepower, engines initially uh, air-cooled, but there was a problem with that, and I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, Thomas Baldwin had become fairly famous as a performer um, at air shows. He would go up in a balloon and jump out with a parachute of his own design and give the spectators a thrill. Um, there are different stories about he, how he became aware of Curtis's engines, but uh, one of them was he was sitting in his, uh, underneath his, one of his balloons and uh, having a lot of trouble with the engine. And he heard a much more regular putt putt and looked and there was this fellow pulling up on a motorcycle. So he went to talk to him and then he went to Hammond's port and he bought an engine and he used it. Uh, at the air, the, um, in his airship at the St. Louis World's Fair. And it was a very successful uh, demonstration. And that's what it looked like. You notice it's not like a later blimps, although there's no solid structure inside. So it's really a blimp. Um, but there are no fins on it. Uh, the engine was down here. Uh, Baldwin felt the necessity to put it at the center of, uh, of gravity of, of the uh, installation. And there's a long shaft, the propellers on the front, and this big thing in the back is the rudder. So uh, his first events in aviation, uh, 
June 28th, 1907, uh, he gets to fly in a dirigible. Uh, and there he is, and he, he's all by himself in it. Uh, you notice the rudder is an American flag. Um, that year, uh, he meets Bell. Uh, they talk a bit, and Bell convinces him uh, to join this association uh, that Bell is just forming, the Aerial Experiment Association. And their objective is to fly airplanes, to make airplanes and fly them. Uh, they have no intent of, of manufacturing airplanes. They just want to prove that it can be done. In 1908 is his first flight in an airplane. And then later uh, that year, he designs his first airplane. He's got a water-cooled dirigible engine. Um, it works very well, uh, but it only lasts for three minutes and then it overheats. So he figures out that he's going to need a water-cooled engine. Uh, and then he works on that. So uh, we'll talk about the uh, Aerial Experiment Association a little bit. Uh, they build four airplanes. Uh, each one is designed by a different member of this, the association. Uh, and actually the association was, where is that? No, never mind. <laughs> uh, it's on this page someplace. Okay. Um, the first aircraft they call the Red Wing. Uh, it had sled runners and they were flying this off the ice on Lake Kuka. Um, so that's where they were doing their work. The pilot, however, was seated. Uh, if you recall the early uh, Wright airplanes, the pilot was lying down on the wing. Uh, they did not use wing warping and they put in a second elevator in the back. Now, the Wrights had one elevator in the front and they started uh, with an elevator in the front and then they added a second one. Uh, they used trusses to curve the wings. The bottom wing curves up, the top wing curves down. Uh, the curvature of the bottom wing gives the airplane stability. Um, but they had no lateral control and we'll talk more about uh, lateral control. And that is they could fly straight, uh, but they had no way of turning. Uh, and on March 12th of 1908, they made the first flight of that airplane. And it was also the first public flight in the United States. Remember the Wrights uh, had flown in 1903, first flight uh, and they're given great and, and deserved credit for that. But then they retired uh, and they made no public flights. The second plane was the white wing and they added wheels with balloon tires and a tricycle landing gear. Um, they had small ailerons uh, on the other upper wing tips. Um, and that was Bell's idea. And there you can see the little aileron on the wingtip. Uh, ailerons are little aerodynamic surfaces that move up or down. Uh, you move it up on one wing and down on the other. It decreases the lift on one and increases the lift on the other. And that causes the airplane to bank. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There's also a shoulder yoke which goes over the pilot. And by moving that uh, left and right, uh, he controls those the ailerons. Uh, Curtis added a steerable front wheel so the plane could maneuver on the ground. And the first flight of this airplane was the first in America wheeled takeoff. And Curtis, that's the airplane he flew in for the first time. And his first flight was over a thousand feet 
the others who had flown the plane before that uh, weren't able to go that far at that point. Okay, so then the third airplane from uh, the AEA was called the June Bug. Curtis designed this and piloted it. And while the designs of the others had taken six or seven weeks, this only took three weeks. Of course, they, each, each plane uh, ended its flying uh, career in a crash. <laughs> and so he was able to take some parts out of the previous one. And there he is flying in the June bug. Uh, the ailerons were improved. Uh, the airplane didn't turn uh, when they were deflected, but it did bank. Uh, Curtis put the engine controls on the wheel. Um, now the first one of the AA aircraft had a wheel. Uh, and if you recall, the Wright brothers didn't initially. Uh, the wings to this plane could be uh, removed, and he had a V8 40 horsepower um, air cooled engine on it. And there's a picture of the engine. Okay. This airplane, compared to the ones before, had improved range and stability. Uh, Curtis flew at 1266 feet in the first flight, and it also provided for the first uh, officially recognized, pre-announced, and publicly observed flight in the United States. So these guys, although it was a small association of uh, just five, uh, including two engineers from Canada, uh, recent graduate engineers, uh, but who were flight enthusiasts, um, and Bell and a lieutenant uh, from the US Army. And he was assigned to this group. That was his army assignment. Um, OK. Then the last airplane was the Silver Dart. And it was their most successful. It was completed in December of 1908. And then they took it up to uh, Canada to Nova Scotia, and it was the first airplane flight in Canada. And there it is. And you can see the elevators in the front. You can see the ailerons and the wingtips, the tricycle landing gear, the pilot sitting down with a, a wheel in front of him. I'm now going to go through the next few years, one at a time, and uh, tell you about the different advancements uh, that were made, and in particular by, um, by Curtis. So I already mentioned February 23rd, 1909, first flight in Canada. Uh, Curtis then uh, established the first flying field, Hempstead and Plains on Long Island. Um, he also set up the first flying school there. And that's where he trained a number of the pilots that uh, then worked with him uh, doing demonstrations around the country. Um, he flew the Golden Flyer, another plane that, um, that he designed. Uh, and the Scientific American had set up a three-stage uh, trophy competition uh, and Curtis had won the first leg just, just by flying on Long Island. Uh, but this one, he flew uh, around the course uh, at that field that he had set up uh, and won the second trophy. Uh, and the next week, Blerio flies across the English Channel. Uh, and he takes about 37 minutes to do that, uh, not going very fast, about 40 miles an hour. But that's what was going on at this time. Um, he, uh, Curtis forms with Herring a company uh, to build airplanes. And they put the ailerons between the wings. You can see them here. And he had a four-cylinder water-cooled 
24 horsepower engine on this. The prop was made of laminated wood, uh, which was an advancement. And uh, the Herring Curtis Company sold an airplane to the Aero Club of New York. And that was the first commercial sale in the United States. Uh, and then the, the uh, Aero Association in the United States under the auspices of the International Federation uh, gave Curtis the first American uh, aircraft license. Uh, and they decided he was worthy of it because he'd made the first public flights uh, before the Wright brothers. So here's the Wright brothers flying machine patent. Uh, very simple, I can't even see the engine on it. Uh, this is the front, that's the back. Um, and three years after they filed, uh, their patent was granted, and then they felt they could go ahead and make uh, public flights. Um, and the Wrights were aware of what the um, uh, AEA was doing. And Orville Wright warned Curtis in July of 1908 that the ailerons violated the Wright's patents uh, because they served the same purpose as the Wright's wing warping, which was to put a wing up and the other wing down. Oops. Um, okay. Um, okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Bell decided that there really was no infringement and they should proceed. So here's some information about the lawsuit. It was brought in 1909 and their position was that because they invented the airplane and they uh, specified particular things about an airplane, anyone who wanted to make an airplane in the US had to pay them a 20% royalty. And it was all based on lateral control. That was one of the um, elements of their uh, patent. So the courts issued an injunction prohibiting Curtis from building, selling, exhibiting airplanes. But in August of 1909, he went to Reims in France and he locked his rudder and therefore said he was not violating any, any patent. Uh, that's a picture of the airplane he flew there. And there are a lot of stories that go with that, but we don't have time. Um, and then from December 31st of 1909 to June 5th of the next year, uh, the injunction was declared invalid. It was reinstituted and then a more powerful one was issued. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what were the effects of the lawsuit? Well, the Herring Curtis Company went bankrupt because the army withdrew the big order that it had issued to them. Wright's interests were held by a corporation that wanted to monopolize the air. Uh, he had, uh, the Wrights had stated that they had been left in absolute control of the aeroplane business in the United States. Absolute control. So Curtis went out to Dayton to, uh, to talk to them and they offered him 20% royalty on airplanes, 20% of ex the exhibition gates. This is at the air shows. So Curtis didn't like that. He went back to Hammondsport. At this point, the press was supporting the rights, not Curtis. But one of the judges advised him that he could still fly for prizes. It's not manufacturing. So he decided to try for the New York World Newspaper Prize to fly from Albany to New York City. So this is the Curtis Airplane Company founded by Curtis and he was the president. He stopped motorcycle production and he spent a year in exhibition flying. He was the head of the team. And they went from Los Angeles 
to Memphis, to San Antonio. Uh, and in June, he goes back to Hammondsport and he's trying to take off uh, from the lake uh, an airplane with a canoe under it. So the canoe is to make it uh, uh, move in the water, but he couldn't get it off the water. Then in May, he makes that New York's Albany to New York flight. Uh, and in a speech in New York City after that, he says, the battles of the future will be fought in the air. The days of the big warships are numbered. And in order to uh, demonstrate that, <laughs> he brings some Navy officers up to Lake Kuka and shows an aerial bombing demonstration. So there is this uh, structure in the lake and they're dropping bombs on it, at it from, uh, from airplanes. Uh, then he also demonstrates that you can fire rifles from airplanes. And this uh, Lieutenant Fickle was a sharpshooter and hit the targets he aimed at. And there's a picture of him doing that. Although I think this picture was taken on the ground. Uh, and then in the summer, he sends a couple of guys to New York City uh, to open a booking office for the Curtis Exhibition Company. They had four or five planes, uh, planes out around the country doing exhibitions. Um, yeah, okay. In 1910, he takes his wife, Leon, Lena, for a ride. And that's the last time he does an exhibition. Uh, in August, uh, he takes uh, McCurdy. McCurdy was one of the uh, five people in the AEA. Uh, they go up and they uh, send a wireless message. And they do that in Sheepshead Bay, uh, Brooklyn. In August, he makes an overwater flight that's uh, very momentous. In September, he goes to the Harvard Boston Aero Meet. And in October, there's an international air meet at the racetrack at Belmont. Uh, we actually live just a couple miles from Belmont. Uh, in November, Eli takes off from the cruiser Birmingham. And in December, Curtis goes to North Island, which is in the San Diego Bay. And he sets up an uh, airfield there uh, to train uh, military pilots. Um, okay, here's some information about the Los Angeles Air Meet in January. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, of Commerce organized it, and it was the first large-scale air show in the United States. The schools were closed. 200,000 people went to that air show, uh, except the rights were not among them. Uh, he sets a new airspeed record. Uh, he had spent, previously set the airspeed record at that uh, air show in France. William Boeing was 28 and he went, but no one would take him up for a ride. And Jimmy Doodle was only age 13 and he saw his first airplane there. So here's the Albany to New York City flight. Uh, before the flight, he drives up the Hudson and then he gets in a, a boat and goes up the Hudson and he finds a, uh, a place to stop in Schenectady. Uh, and it's a um, asylum, asylum for the insane. And he talks to the superintendent who tells him, of course you can land here. Most of you flying machine inventors end up here anyway. <laughs> So he flies a Hudson Flyer biplane, which was a bigger airplane than what he flew at Reims. 50 horsepower engine, flotation gear. He refuels near Poughkeepsie from a passing motorist who gives him gasoline and oil. Then he lands at Spitten Devil at 207th Street. Uh, and there's a map showing you where Spitten Devil is in the um, in the Bronx. This is Manhattan. Okay. Uh, and then he flies on to uh, Governor's Island. 
which is past the southern end of Manhattan. The whole thing he does in two hours and 32 minutes, 150 miles, roughly uh, 60 miles an hour. And there's a picture of that uh, airplane. Uh, you can see the floats, you can see the, uh, uh, these pontoons. Okay. So his overwater flight was also um, notable. He flew from Cleveland to Sandusky over Lake Erie. It took an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and then he went back the next day. Uh, this was a record setting overwater flight. He won a $15,000 prize. Remember, he's not building and selling airplanes at this point. So this prize money was important to him. There were 100,000 spectators. Uh, there's the airplane. You can see the ailerons are now placed between the wings instead of at the wingtip. Uh, there's a crowd airplane in the background. Somebody with a blurry face shaking his hand. <laughs> and there's a map showing you that here's Cleveland and here's Sandusky. But the flight is over the water. At the Harvard Boston Aero Meet, which is in September of 1910, that's only the second air meet held in this country. 67,000 spectators, President Taft shows up. Uh, there were international contestants, money prizes. Uh, Glenn Curtis was one of 19 aviators there. Uh, and also uh, Thomas Baldwin. Graham White was the big winner. He got $22,000 uh, and they had nine events, uh, testing for speed, altitude, uh, duration, distance, and dropping bombs on a battleship. And this was repeated in 1911. Uh, this is a postcard signed by Wilbur Wright Although he was not in that list of aviators there, apparently he was there because on this he said this card was flown at the Boston Aero Meet, September 1910 by Wilbur Wright. Hmm. Then at Belmont Park, also in late 1910, the first international air meet, there were 40 aviators, 100,000 spectators each day. All right, so this is 10 days. That's a million people. Uh, new altitude records, endurance and speed records were set and there was a race to the Statue of Liberty uh, and a Gordon Bennett Trophy race. The Gordon Bennett Trophy uh, was the one that, let's say, I forgot that, uh, was set up by, uh, by the Smithsonian at, uh, at uh, Bill's uh, suggestion. Then uh, Eugene Eli takes off from the cruiser Birmingham also in 1910. Now they built this uh, platform on the front of the boat. Uh, and this was, this was really very important because um, he was a member, Eli, while he was a member of, of Curtis's team, he also, also was also a US Naval Aeronautical Reserve uh, pilot. So this isn't a Curtis uh, Model D. Uh, he flew two and a half miles after he took off and landed on the beach in, in Virginia. And this aroused worldwide interest in this idea of flying from a ship. Actually, Curtis had got that idea while he was flying down the Hudson. Uh, and then, then he sets up, uh, I believe he bought this land and then set up an airfield there. So they plowed the tall grass uh, for about a mile 
and he offered to train military pilots at no expense uh, for free. So uh, his purpose was to get the military interested in airplanes and having their own pilots. And this is now a Naval Air Station because after he finished training the first pilots there, uh, I think three years later, he donated the land. Okay. These are the first four pilots, uh, three from the Army uh, and one from the Navy, all lieutenants, and here's Curtis amongst them. They all look very serious to me. <laughs> and here's Lieutenant Beck in one of those training planes. The planes initially were single seaters. So Curtis established a very rigorous program of training where he put a speed monitor uh, on the engine. And so for the first stage, they could roll around on the ground, but not get up to flight speed. Then he increased that, they went around faster, increased it again, they were able to take off and fly a little bit, and then finally uh, fly further distances. And none of them were injured. So here are some 1911 milestones. Um, in January, Eli, the same Eugene Eli, landed on a naval ship. Uh, then Curtis uh, made the first takeoff from the water and then landed on it. Uh, he made the first successful pontoon aircraft. That is, it's a land aircraft that you put the floats under. Um, he carried the first passenger in a seaplane. He created dual pilot controls. That's if there are two seats in the airplane and you want to teach someone to fly, that's very handy. Uh, they put in retractable landing gear on his hy hydro aeroplane. Uh, and also they conducted the first air sea rescue. Uh, they used the Curtis seaplane to land where this pilot had crashed. And along with Neil Burgess, they became the first licensed aircraft manufacturer in the United States. They also, uh, Curtis made the first hydroplane flight to a ship. Hydroplane being something that uh, flies and uh, but takes off from the water. And then he made the first amphibian aircraft. And with it, he was able to take off and go out for lunch and then come back. In 1911, the US Congress uh, passed an act authorizing $25,000 to the Navy to purchase aircraft. And so they set uh, contracts for two Curtis and one Wright air airplane. Um, the Navy, this is not a lot of money. The Navy decided they couldn't spend all that on airplanes and, and return some to the Treasury. Um, Curtis went back to Hammondsport. He rented part of North Island to the Army so they could continue training pilots there. Uh, he got the first pilot's license and his A1 triad. This is this. Uh, amphibian uh, was the first naval aircraft and, he, and Curtis flew it. And the first aviator in the Navy was Ellison, whom uh, Curtis had trained at North Island and they became very good friends. Can you still see the shared screen? Is anybody yes. there? Yes. Yes, we can see it, but there's some black marks covering some of the text. Yeah, I I, I don't know how to get rid of that. Okay. Yeah. Just just uh, go ahead. More milestones in uh, 1911. Uh, Curtis taught the first woman how to fly, Blanche Stewart Scott. 
Uh, and that was on Long Island. Uh, there she is in an airplane with a steering wheel. Uh, there's another picture of her. In September, uh, they made the first catapult. Uh, they flew the first airmail to Mineola from uh, the field uh, on Long Island. And in October, uh, the three airplanes were delivered to the Army and the Navy. And at the end of the year, Bell and his four partners got their patent granted. So Eli lands on the cruise of Pennsylvania in San Francisco Bay. Dave, I think your uh, slides are not advancing. We're still on 31. Yeah, that's why it's a good pause. I think you should get out and go back in. Just I'm not a minute, sure just a minute. Yeah. Okay. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right. That's number 33. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so, all right. Thank you for telling me that. All right, so uh, a wooden deck was built on the stern. Uh, and here's a picture of Eli approaching and just about landing down. Uh, they put a resting gear. That's what all these ropes across uh, the deck are with weights on the end. Um, Eli took off from a camp Selfridge. The camp was named for Selfridge. Uh, he was the first airplane fatality when the Wrights were demonstrating a plane to the army in 1908. And the plane crashed, Selfridge was died and Orville Wright was injured and took months to recover. Uh, so you, Eli grabbed the 11th. I'm not sure how many ropes there were. I tried counting. <laughs> it looks like about 15 uh, and landed. And then after lunch, they turned him around. He took off. The Navy was not ready for this. Uh, it got a lot of publicity, but the Navy wasn't ready. Um, 1911, he took off uh, from the water. Uh, the first successful uh, airplane doing that. And you can see the ailerons here are now on the wing strut, the strut that goes from the upper to the lower wing and the, the rear one. And that, so that's where the ailerons are. Uh, this was his first seaplane flight to a ship, uh, February 11th in San Diego Harbor. Uh, for this, uh, I'm not sure why, but he decided to make a tractor uh, seaplane. Uh, so here's the engine in the front. All the previous airplanes uh, from Curtis had the engine in the back and an elevator out in front. So here he's inspecting the airplane, taking off. Uh, he lands near the ship and taxis to it. Uh, and then they let down uh, this hoist, they hook it up to the airplane and lift him to the ship. But Curtis was afraid that with his weight on the airplane, uh, that it might be too much and the ship, the airplane might collapse. So here he is above the airplane hanging on to the hoist. Okay. Now in 1912, other things happened. Uh, set up a flight school in Miami Beach, uh, built the first flying boat on Lake Kuka. Uh, they built a Curtis, uh, uh, an air catapult to launch uh, the seaplane. And Curtis wrote a book called the Curtis Aviation Book. And actually, if you uh, Google that, you can, you can see it online. Um, Lawrence Sperry went to Hammondsport to work on uh, an autopilot. Um, and he put that together and flew it on a Curtis C2 flying boat. Uh, 
Then Curtis built the Model F that had a V-shaped bottom, cushion seats, and for the first time, dry passengers. And that's what it looked like. It's starting to look more like a modern airplane. Although the engines uh, still had the props in the back. That's the Model F. Um, he set up a flying school for Army, Navy, and sports flyers. And the Navy sets up a base at Lake Cooper. 1913, Curtis goes to Europe twice, sets up uh, multiple agencies. Uh, he wins the Langley Medal, which looks like that. European governments are now spending millions of dollars on military aviation. It's 1913, things are getting a little hairy in Europe. And the US Congress appropriates 125,000. On November 18, Lincoln Beachy, now Lincoln Beachy had become the most famous flyer doing oh, air show after air show all around the country. He built a specially built Curtis biplane and flew it upside down and did a loop, the first ever accomplished uh, in the air, at least in this country. The, the Frenchman had done it uh, a month earlier. Um, and Curtis initially was not in favor of trying this. He said, your engine is going to quit when you're upside down and you're going to fall like a rock. But apparently the engine kept running. And there is Vichy uh, in the Curtis airplane. You see another V8 engine. So the Wrights continued their lawsuits and they won appeals in 1913. And Curtis was ordered to stop producing airplanes and not use airplanes that operated uh, with the ailerons simultaneously uh, operating. So he made independent ailerons. Uh, 1914, uh, it was suggested to him uh, by one of his partners that he fly the Langley Aerodrome. Now Langley had two unsuccessful attempts to fly his aerodrome from a, um, uh, a boat that was in the, um, in the river in Washington. So to fortify his argument against the lawsuit, uh, if the Langley airplane could be demonstrated to have been capable of flight, then the Wrights didn't build the first airplane capable of flight. Uh, they just flew the first airplane capable of flight. 1917 World War finally ends the suit. Uh, and the uh, army tells both Curtis and the corporation that was continuing the rights interests uh, that you both get 1% uh, royalties from now on and you interchange patents and, and we're going to end all this squabbling. Um, Sperry takes his autopilot, flies it solo over Paris, and then in June, Sperry takes a French mechanic and they fly a courtesy to flying boat at the airplane safety competition in Paris, demonstrating the automatic pilot. And you can see that in this picture. Here's the mechanic and Sperry's sitting there. I don't think you can see it, but his hands are being held. They make three flights over the river in front of the stands. The first one is no hands. The second one is with the mechanic on the wing. The band plays La Marseillaise. And the third one, no pilot. Uh, Sperry climbs out of the uh, cockpit as well, 
And the comment is may say in a we, which means that's never been done. That's incredible. That's crazy. Yeah. And they win a $10,000 prize. So then World War I starts. Uh, and World War I um, is, is amazing because aircraft development uh, really speeds up. Uh, other things that happened that year, uh, Curtis builds the first uh, seaplane intended to fly across the Atlantic, but the war interrupts that. Uh, Lincoln Beachy races a Curtis biplane against Barney Oldfield at the Brighton Beach racetrack in Brooklyn. Uh, the race ends when Beachley crashes on the track. <laughs> but there they are. Uh, Beachy in the airplane and Oldfield in his racer. Uh, in 1914, he does 35 air shows and is termed the world's greatest aviator. Uh, they estimate 14 million people see him fly that year, and the US population is only 74 million. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good fraction of the American. Curtis Seaplanes. He was responsible for the tandem float hydroplane, one float in back of the other. Single flown hydroplane, pictured there. Tractor hydroplane, the one he flew to the ship in. The Triad A1 seaplane, which was the first plane sold to the Navy. And there's a short video, but we're not gonna do that. Um, so flying boats. 1912 was the first one. Uh, he had a glider, which he towed from a powered boat. Uh, he did a couple of dozen tests of hulls. And finally, the stepped hull allowed the boat to get off the water. Uh, and he continued uh, building more and more uh, flying boats. And this was the Flying Boat America the first dual engine flying boat in the world. Uh, and this is the HS2, a later one. And then in 1918, he built the NC1, two, three, and four. Uh, those were big uh, aircraft and I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. Uh, during the war, um, well, just before the war, Curtis goes to uh, England and he asks a, an airplane designer to design him a, a tractor biplane. Uh, Thomas sends that design to Curtis and uh, Curtis brings Thomas to Hammondsport. Um, and they make the Curtis Model J. He gets a large order from Britain and he builds a plant in Buffalo. In world, during World War I, the JN4, the fourth uh, model, was the trainer for both the Americans and the British. He established the first airmail service using a Jenny. After the war, the Jennies were barnstorming all over the place. There were a lot of surplus. And in 1923, Lindbergh's first airplane was JN4. And there's a picture of the uh, prototype Model J. Okay. So JNs, the Jennies were the first airplanes to go to a Signal Corps Aero Squadron. In 1916, um, the, the Curtis Airplane and Motor Company absorbs the Curtis Airplane Company and the motor company and Curtis gets four and a half million dollars and four and a half uh, and 50% of the stock. He got a canoe machine to rise from the water and Boeing finally gets to fly in a Curtis hydroplane, but he doesn't like it. He thinks he can do much better. Um, okay, in 1916, uh, Curtis Model F goes to the first Battalion Navy Militia of New York. And some of the uh, Curtis 
uh, Janice go to Mexico to the Pancho Villa expedition. And there they are in Mexico. The first mass cross-country flight of the military aircraft was done with 10 Jennies. They go from New York uh, to Philadelphia, to Princeton and back. And then the Curtis Airplane and Motor Company, 1916. Uh, they produce over 10,000 aircraft during World War I. They are the largest manufacturer in the world. They set up uh, an R&D factory in Garden City on Long Island. They build the world's first aerial torpedo, but they don't fly it. That's what it looked like. And the Curtis Company makes many aircraft designs after World War I. World War I, as I said, accelerated the pace of airplane development. Uh, tens of thousands of aircraft were built, but there were no US land planes in combat. The need for aerodynamics was recognized. And that was a great thing. Yeah. So here's a picture of the NC-1. It flew 51 people wow. in 1918. And the first transatlantic flight, the NC-1, 3, and 4 all left Jamaica Bay on Long Island, crew of six on each. They all flew to Newfoundland. They all mm -hmm. left Newfoundland. Uh, the NC-4 was the only one that got to the Azores. It left the Azores, uh, flew to Lisbon, and then to Plymouth, England. And there's a picture of the NC-4. Wow. It was a big airplane for 1918. All right, after 1920, uh, Curtis, after just 13 years in the aviation business, went to Florida, got to the cover of Time, and the Curtis Wright Corporation was formed in 1929 uh, from a whole bunch of companies uh, that carried the Curtis name or the Wright name, but Curtis was not involved and Orville was not involved. Wilbur had died in 1912. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of the Curtis Condor, which was a bomber and a civilian aircraft. Oops. Okay. This is the famous flag of the Curtis Jenny upside down. Uh, if you have one, uh, congratulations, it's worth a lot of money. Uh, and Curtis uh, was in, inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame and the Cradle of Aviation, uh, Cradle of Aviation Museum Hall of Fame. Okay. These were all different companies with the Curtis name on them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. So one of my questions was why was the US so far behind by 1917 when he entered the war? Well, one reason was the right secrecy after 1903. In other countries, people picked up on it, but here the rights instead uh, created these lawsuits. Early daredevil flying in this country uh, to keep the crowds amused, the pilots did all kinds of daredevil things. A lot of them crashed and died. And the general public decided that airplanes are not of much use except for what those daredevils were doing. So the press picked up on that, the president picked up on it, and the government did not invest. World War I in Europe also. So what is his legacy? He is definitely the father of naval aviation. Hydroplane step allowed flying boats, seaplanes, amphibians, aircraft carriers, catapults, arresting gear. All these things are still in use. And he is really the founder of the American aircraft industry. Airliners, airplanes as weapons, flight schools, 
using ailerons, tricycle, tricycle and retractable landing gear, engines. And in 1917, he had the idea for an autoplane. Never flew it, but the idea was firm. And then the Curtis Wright Corporation. So in 1978, NBC had a special, The Winds of Kitty Hawk. It showed Curtis to have all these attributes, a liar, a thief, sly, greedy, untrustworthy, bitter, bitter, <laughs> driver, <laughs> cocky, insolent, a summer flyer afraid of the wind. Meryl Stickler, who was a writer and I believe knew Curtis, uh, wrote that this was the ill winds of Kitty Hawk because none of those things are true. He was oh, wow. modest, determined, inspired, loyalty among those who worked with him, and all the rest of these things. Totally different from what this NBC uh, portrayed him as. So he was a true aviation pioneer. He was led to aviation by a sequence of events kind of out of his control. His efforts and innovations have lasting impact, whereas there's nothing that the rights added that is still in use. But conflict persists between his admirers and those of the rights. This is a picture of the GHC Museum. It's just south of Hammondsport, it has a bunch of airplanes in it and a bunch of other things. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, took just over an hour. What? What? No, 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 no. In between. What are you talking about? Enlarge the screen. Don't close the window. Where is enlarge the screen? Right? Oh, there. You can yeah. point it over there. Okay. There you All go. All right, guys. <laughs> I'm out of breath. Um, and I hope you have some comments or questions. <laughs> Did I? Yeah. All right, Harold. Yeah, Dave. Dave, I don't know. Is a plane with the the uh, elevator in front more stable somehow? I mean, I thought that was. I don't think so, but I don't think the rights thought of putting it in the same place with the rudder. Uh, and then it was not until the um, aerial experiment uh, third airplane put an elevator in the back, but they still had one in the front. Yeah. And it was after that. You notice that up until 1910 or so, just about all the successful planes had that same kind of a arrangement. Um, but the Wrights didn't, uh, didn't invent that arrangement. Uh, that was done earlier, and the um, Aerial Experiment Association claimed that while their plane looked like the right plane, it was because they both copied the same, same guy. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that elevator in front has <laughs> not come back. <laughs> um, anything else? Scott? Yeah, so uh, well, first, uh, thanks for the talk. I just, you know, it's nice to get a little history like that. So it was really enjoyable. Um, curious, I know there was obviously you talked about a lot of aviation innovations. How much of it do you think was just making better engines? Was that happening at the same time? Um, yeah. Um, Curtis was making better engines all the time, and, and others started competing with him. Uh, but one of the main things that he determined, I think I mentioned, was his eight-cylinder air-cooled engine heated up after three minutes. Yeah. So if you wanted to set a speed record on a motorcycle, that was fine. You didn't have to go more than three minutes. But for the airship, it's no good. So he developed a, a water-cooled engine, and that's what he gave to... Uh, the airship uh, captain. Yeah. A lot of comments. Did Anything you, else? Well, automobiles had 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 water cooled engines, so it was. 
it's just amazing the speed at which he was able to do all this stuff. Yeah, to, to invent and improve engines at the same time. I, I don't know engines. So, I mean, I assume, you know, this, this four cylinder water cooled one, it, it would be miserable by today's standards. I mean, by today's standards, it'd be, I don't know, 200 horsepower or something. I mean, uh, people know, I, I don't know. Just I didn't guess. see anything attributed to Curtis in that time period of that horsepower. He had a 50 horsepower engine. And I think the ones that went on the NC uh, models were 80 horsepower. What, what, what a modern engine of that size. Anybody know, you know, that weight today? Would it, would it, would an engine of that weight be, you know, 300 horsepower or of engines? Of, of the same weight? Yeah, right. Just to do comparison of how much engines have improved. Just, just curious. I, I don't know. Uh, the engine in your automobile is, is not that light. It's, yeah. How many horsepower is in an automobile? Is that 300 horsepower? Uh, yeah. There are those with 300 horsepower if, if you yeah. want to get to that through that next traffic light. But um, I think that this, I, I don't know, what are the smallest? A kilowatt per kilo, uh, you know. 10 horsepower. A okay. kilowatt per kilogram is a very good metric. Okay. Now I have to convert that to horsepower because unfortunately we're a idiots. Horsepower, a kilogram, I mean, and, and a kilowatt yeah. hour, uh, well, one is, uh, yeah, uh, horsepower seven forty six watts. Okay, yeah. it's it's not that far, is what I'm saying. Is there yeah. about a little less than a kilowatt? Yeah. I, I Howard would know this, but yeah, a friend of mine who who had raced cars for a while, it was a Toyota four cylinder engine. They would soup up, and it would put out souped up around two hundred fifty horsepower with a weight in the 150 pound range, mm. but that was, uh, th they didn't have the compression way back in the rights and Curtis's days that we do now. So you, yeah. you didn't have the, the, the yeah. power. We use uh, to get high compression in an engine and turbocharge it, you have to use direct injection. And we, we can get well over 200, even 300 horsepower out of two liters. Of a two liter engine, but a uh, common horsepower for a two liter engine could be anywhere from you know naturally aspirated, um, nothing too fancy, 120 horsepower up to uh, easily 220 horsepower or, more, or close to 300 horsepower with a turbocharge. Yeah, and also the fuel, um, a lot of work was done on fuel. In fact, Doolittle spent his entire career working for, I think, Shell Oil or something like that, mm. developing fuel specifically for aircraft. And the, 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 the original stuff was really crude. We had a large, well, was it 1969 Dodge? Oh with, my God, the Polaris. With a 318 horsepower engine, which was their second biggest. And the trunk Those are big engines, though. filled with throat screens for a month. Yeah. I had three little kids. That car was perfect. <laughs> the 60s, we, we, we had the uh, six or seven liters, and we got, you know, four over 400 horsepower, naturally aspirated V8. Uh, yeah, I was getting eight miles to the gallon. And we, and we used uh, leaded fuel so that we could uh, have the higher compression ratio. Yeah. yeah. David, you mentioned uh, the uh, tractor biplane. What configuration uh, leads to it being called a tractor? Oh, if the engine's in the front, it's pulling, pulling oh. the airplane. If it's in the back, it's pushing the airplane. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm impressed. As they said in the beginning, that Curtis stopped school in the eighth grade. Think about what he accomplished and what he understood and did with an eighth grade education. I think that's amazing. Well, I, it appears most of his education was outside of school. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, I mean, just, just the mechanical aptitude that he had mm -hmm. when he was still a child. And he just kept that going. He looked at uh, a problem and said, there's got to be a solution and I'm going to come up with it. And there's case after case in the biographies of that. Um, just, just trying to get off the water. Uh, at one point when he was determined to do that, I think they said 21 different designs for the hull. Uh, so he kept at it until he got something that worked. Yeah, figuring out how to get a hull to plane. Pardon me? Getting a hull to plane to go faster than, than what's called hull speed to get it to plane up was probably one of their challenges. Yeah. yeah. A hull displacement hull can only go at a certain speed efficiently. To get to go much faster, you have to plane. So that it was probably an issue for them to conquer. Yeah. And I'm not sure where the step up idea came from, but, but once they used that, they were fine. I mean, that plane took off every time they ran it up. Whereas with the others, occasionally they'd get off, but uh, they couldn't count on it. Engine design and uh, where the valves are and uh, the compression uh, the uh, combustion chamber design, all those things uh, have changed a lot. In the 60s, when we had all those big engines, they were what we called wedge heads. And they weren't, uh, it wasn't easy to get high compression in an engine like that. Then we came out with hemispherical heads and we did a much better job of uh, controlling compression and, and detonation. Mm -hmm. um, and valve placement and all the other things became very important. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that Curtis never, never tried was the rotary engine. Uh, in World I War I, you. there were uh, French rotary engines in, in, in which the engine... Radial engines. Was yeah, it was a radial engine, and the engine cylinders were hooked up to the propeller. So as the propeller turned, so did the uh, cylinders, and that gave them a lot more airflow over the cylinders. Um, but uh, Curtis never got involved with that. Yeah. All right, if there's nothing David, else, David, I have I have one uh, question. Thank you so much. I mean, I never, I learned quite a bit about Curtis and he was quite an innovator throughout. A few years ago, I happened to read uh, Walter Isaacson's book about uh, Wright Brothers. You may have read Some of you, I see some smiling faces over there nodding. Yes. Um, the impression, I, I don't remember much of the book other than it, it was beautiful. It was wonderful reading it at that time. And I thought that uh, Wright Brothers also kept innovating, kept adding lots of interesting things that made it possible. And they did describe Curtis's contributions, but perhaps not. And I remember the Langley incidents being described in the book. Um, and the, uh, the big thing about, well, but I, I was, uh, I'm, I was quite uh, taken by your comment that the Wright Brothers, they didn't do much after their first thing, but which? Well, they, they continued to improve their airplanes. Their first flight was 120 feet. Yeah. And a few years later, they were flying miles and miles. Um, so they did improve their airplanes. They adopted the tricycle landing gear. They adopted the steering wheel, the sit down pilot, but all these things came from Curtis. So there, the authors who write about Curtis repeat that statement that I made because it, I actually took it from one of them that there's nothing endearing from the rights in, in the aviation industry. I see. Of course, there was Curtis Wright Corporation. Uh, 
but neither Curtis nor the Wrights were involved in it. So. Yeah. David, I listened to him give this talk in front of his, the societies that he's been involved in. And people got up and challenged him <laughs> about his attitude with the Wright brothers. They were offended. Yeah. You know, how dare you attach these American heroes that invented the airplane? Yeah. And I think that motivated him to continue to get the message out. Yeah. Did Curtis, did Curtis write the book about Curtis? Did he what? That Isaacson would have written the book about Curtis. I don't know. I don't know. There, as I say, sides. When, when are people are doing books, they do they take sides because it's more interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. you have to create. You have to make a villain out of the. And they're both. Well, that's what both they did on the yeah. television yeah. story. They did about. Well, after Wilbur died, mm -hmm. it was after a year. Now Wil Wilbur was the the more genius of the two, and. He died after a whole year of heated contests with Curtis. And Orville blamed Curtis for Wilbur's death. And so that, I guess, encouraged him in a way to continue with the lawsuits and everything. He, he wanted to break Curtis, but <laughs> Curtis never gave up. <laughs> so... Did Curtis patent any of his innovations? Ah, uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not Could sure. be continued. Yeah, we I'm need to find sure. these things out. Right. <laughs> There's so much if, to know. If you go online, there are some wonderful videos. Uh, and there's one that, that I, ha I haven't watched the whole thing, but it, it's about the controversy between Curtis and the rights. I think it's 33 minutes. So. Well, you know, you know, I, I, I happened to look it up while you were doing your talk. Uh, Curtis, when Curtis died, he was worth $109 million, which would be a multi-billionaire today. Right. So he, he was one busy guy. Well, uh, it, when yeah. he, went, he didn't stop when he went to Florida and was out of the aviation business. He was involved in starting towns, uh, Hialeah, uh, Miami, I think. Uh, wow. He was selling uh, airboats that, uh, you know, the, the boat that goes through the Everglades with the aircraft engine and the propeller in the back. Yeah. He was selling those. He was uh, selling house trailers. Um, and and he really never stopped. Yeah, he was a genius. He was a super genius. I I, I would say so. <laughs> yeah. Tesla. He was a Nikola Tesla, right? Right. Well, maybe without the attitude, perhaps. But maybe he did. Have, he probably had an attitude. Who knows? <laughs> These guys are not choir boys. Well, well Dave, I think you have uh, prompted me to actually. Pick up the book again. I'll reread uh, Walter Isaacson's book about it in light of what you told us today. Yeah, yeah. yeah there but, are big Wright fans, um, and there are big Curtis fans, yeah. and <laughs> and he's met uh, many of them. Yeah. He gets well. challenged all the time. But Dave was reading to our grandson when he was younger a book about the Wright brothers. My grandson wasn't too thrilled with it, and David was relieved because he really <laughs> didn't want to read this child's book about how wonderful they are, and you know, so he got off the book. Yeah. We have on Long Island, we have Mitchell Field. There was some controversy sure. there too, big controversy. Well, we live on Long Island, and we've been to the museum many times. You know, they that. I, I actually flew out of Mitchell Field. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to close it here. I'm I'm experiencing um, the 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 time zone thing here. I'm I'm on the I'm on the East Coast now, so. Oh, that's right.
right now. You know what we've been going through. Yeah, you, you guys are past way past my bedtime. So we're gonna we'll be look we'll be uh, talking to you guys and and thank right, you so much. Uh, let's right. have a, a round of applause here for Dave. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, that was awesome. That was awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.